Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night in a panic wondering why your code looks like Plato snakes and not a Christian chapel? Yeah, I didn't think so. But back in 1994, four C++ engineers called the Gang of Four did. They wrote and published a book called Design Patterns. It is the single most influential book in the history of programming even today. When you start your first game development project, you will give up in a week and start watching YouTube videos. With your newfound confidence, you will try again only to realize you don't speak parcel tongue. As you progress, you'll learn about design patterns and you won't have to learn the language of the snakes. But you'll soon learn that no one wants to maintain a chapel for a silly game and you'll go back to being a snake. Most design patterns belong in history books, but some are useful, some are beautiful, and some are weird because I needed a title for this video. Today we'll look at 10 of the most interesting design patterns ever engineered and how they can be used to solve multiple game development problems in the real world. Speaking of multiple, we have the singleton pattern. One of the weirdest things in programming is object-oriented design where classes act as blueprints which you can then use to instantiate as many objects as you want. A singleton is a type of object that can only be instantiated once. It seems counterintuitive but it makes total sense when you realize you need a centralized system to act as God and control every action in your game, which you can then misuse as a global warehouse for storing all kinds of data and creating spaghetti code. It's an interesting pattern to think about philosophically but the general idea behind singletons can also be implemented programmatically. Imagine you're playing a game, but what if the game ends and you want to play again? We can't just manually add or remove or reset objects in the scene. We need a game manager to reset the entire scene on the fly. What's interesting is that we can take the starting position and set the scene to this position every time the new game starts. It's the singleton so only one game manager exists at any point in time and follows a consistent set of rules, like in this case updating the position of a player or removing an object when it goes past the screen and doesn't rely on broadcast messages to other classes making our code much simpler. Broadcasting messages brings us to the second item on our list, the observer pattern. The concept can be boiled down to a radio tower which sends out a signal and the observers listen in at the same time and respond to it. It is used all over the place in game development like in Pokemon when the player enters a battle, all the wild Pokemon are subscribed to it and automatically run away when they're nearby. The observer pattern works in two phases. First, the subject notifies all the observers when an event occurs, like in this case a battle has started. When the the subject is done notifying all the observers, they usually call a method in response to this event like running away from the player, allowing us to create an army of entities without them having any knowledge of each other. It works really well in almost all kinds of games and is crucial to fixing many problems caused by other patterns. But now let's get back to creating our army with the factory pattern. It is the magic behind spawning enemies in RPGs like Mario or Pokemon. But the concept of a factory comes from the Latin word factorium, which is a place of makers. In game development, factories are used to to instantiate objects without defining the type of object being instantiated. This might seem absurd at first, but what if you have a player who can be a knight with a sword and a shield or an archer with a bow? We can assign weapons based on what type the player is, but what we can also do is define a weapon factory which can do all of that for us and update itself in the future when we decide to create a mage with a wand. But we can't talk about game development without talking game states, and the most used programming pattern of all time across all games is without a doubt the state pattern. Some random geniuses control the behavior of their characters with switch statements, but the nerds over at Gang of Four found a better way. The idea is to make an object behave differently based on a finite number of states and is quite similar to finite state machines. Here's what the state pattern looks like for Mario. It's incredibly simple. It reads user input every frame and then for each input Mario transitions to a new state. It's incredibly genius because it delegates Mario's behavior to the user's input, but it's also incredibly dumb and useless because it delegates Mario's behavior to the the user's input. Speaking of which, you might be familiar with another useless pattern, the visitor pattern, which tries to modify an element of an object without changing the class. It's like changing the health or mana of your character. As a developer, you can frequently add as many operations to an object without changing its structure. The implementation has been abstracted away in newer programming languages like Python, but if in an alternate reality you're developing games in assembly, then it might be worth it. That's purely hypothetical, but one of the most practical and goaded design patterns of all time is the facade pattern. It's essential for hiding all the corruption, shenanigans, and complexity that the end user doesn't need to know about. But it's based on one simple reality. The user only cares about how the game looks and feels. Like you can create an entire game in a single c -sharp script, but it will take you 300 trillion years to debug. Unless you start leveraging the facade pattern to create a simple API to hide all the low-level details of your code, like when you want to change the UI theme for a festival. At the beginning of this video, I didn't mention the command pattern, but I think it deserves a closer look. So first we have 
have a queue of requests that need to be performed which might represent the locations the player needs to visit. Each request is represented by an object or a command. The pattern starts with an empty queue and then executes each command in order as they are added but delegates them to a separate object. This results in a class which is uncoupled to any request and is independent of how the command is executed. That's cool and all but now let's talk about the mediator pattern. Imagine you are a pilot on an airplane with plans to land on a runway at the London airport. But what if another pilot is too drunk and forgets to clear his plane from the runway? The entire system could collapse. Games have the same problem. Sometimes enemies might collide with each other or start attacking each other instead of the player and you never know where or when that might happen. Luckily design patterns like mediator are designed to solve this. A mediator can keep the enemies running properly even if they don't have information about each other. It works by having objects communicate information to the mediator which can then broadcast messages to all other objects. The other objects will then respond back if they are involved. This removes the need for objects to communicate directly and makes the entire system consistent. Patterns like these are important for spawning random enemies and things like user interfaces. But finally that brings us to the flyweight pattern that blew my mind the other day and inspired me to this video. It's feared because it becomes faster and more efficient as the number of objects in your game increases. That seems impossible but it makes sense once you understand the pattern. It minimizes memory usage by sharing an object's data with other similar objects like when you want to fire projectiles from your player which all share the same settings. Each projectile can have its own texture but their intrinsic state is the same. This is far more practical than creating and destroying objects each time you want to fire an attack. In this case the pattern gets faster with more objects because it's able to skip a higher proportion of data. Finally I can talk about the tense pattern but instead I'll be lazy and ask you to like and subscribe instead.